I'm very pleased to be here uh, and, and always happy to represent the University of Maryland. Perhaps I've been a professor in computer science for a long time. I'm pleased with some of my colleagues, John Folick, who join us here. I see Bill Pugh in the audience, which is really a pleasure. And of course, Catherine Plaisant has been my collaborator for more than 25 years. So it's great stories like that. And other friends and collaborators in the audience make me feel very warm and special. And also to meet new faces and people from new cultures and new new disciplines. Uh, the Human Computer Interaction Lab is this 32-year-old interdisciplinary community that's jointly run by computer science uh, and the College of Information Studies and has partnerships with others around campus, including the wonderfully titled Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, MIF. Uh, so if you want to come out and visit us, and these groups have very active programs that I think will interest many of you. Uh, our website has 750 technical reports, 200 videos, 150 uh, uh, project pages, and lots of software to download, some of which I'll be demonstrating to you. Um, there's a nice video as well over there. Some of you may know me from the book Designing the User Interface, now in fifth edition, and Catherine Plaisant joined me in the fourth and fifth edition to help tell the story of this uh, growing field. We're beginning to explore the daunting possibility of a sixth edition. <laughs> so the focus tonight, though, is about information visualization. Uh, and my uh, efforts began in the early 90s, as I'll show with tree maps. But this book helped catalyze the field with my collaborators, Stu Card and Jock McInlay. Stu gave the subtitle, Using Vision to Think and making clear that our visual system was more than just sort of an input device, more than just a camera, but a way of solving problems. And if we could tap that capability, that evolutionarily refined capability, maybe we could help people understand the world's complexities more effectively. Others followed that theme. Jim Thomas is using the term visual analytics. And then Daniel Keim and friends in Europe echoing those themes in a 300-page book that makes a sort of societal-level uh, argument that visualization is the way to solve problems. These latter two are free on the web, and you can take a look at that. Uh, our work also brought forward the tool called Spotfire, a successful commercial story. I'm not going to go into it, but you know it's very satisfying when you can take an academic paper. And then Christopher Olberg forms a company grows to 200 people and becomes a major internationally important project, especially for valuable applications such as pharmaceutical drug discovery. And the ways it's growing in large spaces like this, and the number of books on visualization have also sort of grown dramatically. That's just a bunch I grabbed from the past year's harvest of books on visualization, uh, including a couple by, uh, by Manuel Lima. Um, so uh, the summary of this, I one time wrote in a playful way that overview first, and then zoom and filter, and then go for details on demand. That became a very simple, I called it mantra, and in the paper I listed it a dozen times in a playful way, suggesting each line was one project where we struggled for weeks and months uh, to come up with the design. And I think what people like about it, there are almost 3,000 citations to this paper from a kind of second-rate uh, conference. But people like it, uh, and they make jokes about it, and they extend it, and they contradict it. Uh, but I think it asserts the centrality of human decision-making, that the human sees the overview. The human zooms in on what they want and filters out what they don't want, as I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, and, and then filters out, you know, and then goes for details on demand. So that idea is carried very far, and the broad view of the field of information visualization um, is the way I see it of scientific visualization, which has a nice 50-year history and great success stories, including Hollywood animations and map systems and uh, uh, 3D games and so on. The growing area of InfoViz is less than 20 years old. And we've got a whole flow of products here. I'm not going to talk about them, but there's a huge area. And then at the bottom, 
I've sort of given a clue to the uh, huge cultural phenomena of blogs that tell the story. Uh, maybe flowing data is a good one, Nathan Yao. Every morning you can see the coolest viz of the day. Uh, and Manuel Lima's uh, visual complexity with 770 network visualizations alone before he gave up and lost energy on that and turned to other things that you'll see in a little while. So the tree map story goes back to about 1990 when I was trying to have a visual representation of what was on my hard drive. And I struggled with this for weeks and months and then had this aha moment uh, in the faculty coffee lounge. Uh, and then I, I found this way of representing which became available in the tree map tool that I'm going to demonstrate in just a few minutes. But just to show you where this traveled, it's maybe most uh, uh, significant early application was this was with Martin Wattenberg, uh, who was then working for Smart Money. And I, as a consultant, helped make the market map. So this is 600 stocks organized into 11 industry groups. The green stocks are rising. The red stocks are falling. Okay, The area represents the market capitalization of a company, a kind of natural idea. And this day that you're looking at is kind of a mixed uh, day. Some things are up and some things are down. There's some areas that are greener, like green for basic materials, and mixed stories on technology. Now look at this one. Anybody see anything interesting there? <laughs> this is a bad day on the stock market. That's what bad days look like. It's a lot of red. However, anybody see anything interesting? Thank you. One little green dot. I love this example. This is real data. Uh, <laughs> and I clicked on that. And it wasn't just a little green. It was bright green. And that was the A&P trading company that that day had bought the Pathmark chain of grocery stores. And they were up 6% when everybody else was down. So what I love about this one is that visualizations give you answers to questions you didn't even have. <laughs> okay, And that it, it, if your eye and mind are trained, you can't help but see these things. Okay, And there's a certain training that you need to do. So here's a little more subtle one. You see the patterns here? Energy is a good day. It's green for energy. And green for technology, with a couple of exceptions. But bad day for financial stocks, banks, insurance companies, investments, so on, and healthcare. But there's one bright exception in the healthcare domain. Okay? So you begin to see these things as your eye gets used to it. This one is a good day. Some people like good news. But you can see this group here, and I know what that is. Those are the gold stocks. I've come to know because of the spatial stability of the design that when the stock market's up, the gold stocks are kind of down. And that's the kind of contrarian story that if you know, you begin to learn about economics by seeing these patterns. Many other people have made tree maps and applications. This one, a young 26-year-old Argentinian. Marcos Westcamp made the news map. It's free on the web. It shows all the news stories on the web as, as, as shown by the, as collected from the Google News Aggregator. The red ones are uh, world news. Uh, these are uh, sports here. Uh, health news, Ebola's. I just grabbed this the other night. 2,210 articles about Ebola. Uh, and then you have, you know, health care, and you have entertainment, technology, and business. So the color code shows the area of interest, and the size is the number of articles. Uh, this was data from Washington Medical Center and showed 6,300 patients. And you can see surprising patterns. I think I'm going to cruise past this in terms of the age and the uh, gender of who is admitted and discharged, etc. Um, the Hive Group licensed our software. Among ma many companies have built commercial tree maps, but they, we have a direct connection with them. And this one shows 1,400 nutritional products. Okay, and these are the fats, oils, and salad dressings, which have low protein, except 
for one bright green spot. And if you click on that, you'll find that it's a soybean salad dressing, which has a lot of protein in it. Okay, so those things make sense. Meat, poultry, and fish are generally high protein, except for these two uh, tan colored ones, which turn out to be two bacon products. Okay, so it does highlight these patterns um, of grain products and generally are, are good, but not great on protein. Uh, and then you have some vegetables are very low and some are, are higher on protein. So you can take a look, they have many popular uh, applications. Spotfire added uh, tree maps about seven years ago and commercial tools like Tableau and others have added them in recent years. The New York Times in 2007 began uh, including tree maps in their representations of the news. This was a very ambitious one by Hannah Fairfield, uh, who's here in Washington, D.C. Is Hannah here tonight? Um, but she did this one which shows six variables about car and truck sales across the United States. And it was pretty ambitious and a lot of data. Uh, they used our software to do the data analysis and then import it into Adobe Illustrator to clean it up, add labels, adjust the colors, add text, and, and make it a professional quality story. Um, the Times also ambitiously followed the research literature. This is the work of Michael Balzer, a, a German mathematician of what he called Voronoi tree maps, and Times used to show the components of the consumer price index and the uh, nice organic circular design is appreciated by many, um, but the odd shaped areas make it a little hard to compare sizes in this version. And finally, for those who want scale, here's a million node tree map of all the uh, directories on the servers in the computer science department at University of Maryland. Um, I mean, it has many lessons and spent, I could talk for an hour, but this is about 7% of the data was ungarbage collected, wasting several hundred gigabytes of storage. Okay. All right. Well, I, I sort of transfer to Manuel Lima, other, you know, examples of trees, and he'll talk more about that. And then we, I just come to the Tree Map Art Project. Please visit our website, which has all of the, the 12 examples hanging in the hallway. They're, they're there in, under the full views. You can download them. They're free to print. They're high-resolution files. You can print them and hang them on your walls if you like. Um, we also show you the 65 draft designs we developed along the way and ones that we you know, decided not to use. So those are the 12 in the exhibit, and again, at the end of this uh, event, I'll take another tour and show people. All right, I think I'm going to uh, go to the demo. Uh, right, okay, follow me on Twitter uh, and visit us at HCIL. There's a strong research group and in computer science. We'll have, maybe you know, but two important speakers, Steve Feiner coming next Friday, October 24th. We'll be speaking about virtual reality and artificial reality, uh, augmented reality, rather. Um, and Henry Fuchs will be coming the 31st of October. Danielle Fisher from Microsoft is coming the 27th of October. So there's a pretty active group, and there's lots of visualizations to be shown there. Okay, maybe you just pause. Any questions so far? Yeah, we'll actually hold the questions until okay. the discussion. So maybe. let me run the program. You can do this. Um, and here is our free commercial application. And I'm going to load a data set, which is one of them in the exhibit, of the National Basketball Association statistics. And so um, now what you're seeing here, this is the way it comes up initially, uh, 441 players. And if I click on any particular one, Iverson, I can take a look. There are about 40 data values for each player. And so you can see it's the number of points they scored, the number of fouls, the number of games they played, and all the, all, you know, about 40 values are in there, okay? Now, this representation, the starter, doesn't really show you much. And I'm advertising that there's, you know, two things you can do. You can use the label, which is natural to put the name of the player. The size, though, we can make for any one of those values. 
And to me, the one that was most interesting among the different values that you could represent were the number of points scored during the year. Okay? Now, this is the squarified version of the tree map. So the big one's up here. Uh, Stackhouse scored 2,380 points, down to the little ones who scored only 10 or 15 or 5 points during the year. Okay? So that's the sort of basic idea. And now we'll color code by something else. So we can color code. And to me, the thing that would have been interesting, if you, even if you don't know too much about basketball, personal fouls. Okay? And I thought that those who score a lot of points probably also get a lot of personal fouls because they're sort of rushing up to shoot and they might get a lot of personal fouls. So I will color code. And the automatic color code you get ranges from black to green. And so uh, I thought uh, that you certainly those who play just a few games and don't score a lot don't have many personal fouls. But there's no yet, we don't see any strong pattern that the ones who scored a lot also had a lot of personal fouls. So we're going to go exploring a little more. There's a few ways to explore. One way is there's a lot of clutter here. So you know the mantra, overview first, zoom and filter. And we could filter out those players who had very few points. So the way we filter will just first highlight those with a small number of points. We can go as far as we want. And then we'll hide the ones that have been filtered. And now we can see a little more clearly what's going on here. Okay? Or if I want to add them back, actually this animation is quite nice. As I add them back, they add automatically. Let me do that again. So I'm going to filter out by the low scoring players. I'll go pretty far. And then I'll hide those. And now we see like the top 50 or so. And we could read the names and go exploring a little more. Or we can add them back here. And you get filters for all the values there. OK? So that's the beginning. That's the way I typically start by setting up a color palette and by choosing color and size to be meaningful variables. But you know, you may want to make a little more dramatic color palette. And so we can bin them and do different color, and we can get a little more extreme. Now we're beginning to see the ones who have high personal fouls standing out. OK, we can go a little further, and getting kind of to the garish end of the spectrum. But <laughs> those purple ones are the real you know, extreme players who have a lot of uh, fouls. We could go further with that and get even more extreme till it's unreadable. Uh, or we'll just backtrack to a smaller number. And if you want to change the palette at any point, uh, it's really very easy to do. If instead of black, I want to do blue for the low end ones, I can make them blue. Okay? So that's how, for the exhibit that you saw, we began to explore color palettes by these very simple processes. Again, no programming. And I'm just showing you how you might be able to do that. Now, we can organize. It's hard to look at 441 at once. So we might impose a hierarchy. One of the pleasures of tree maps is you get size, color, and then a tree structure. So we're going to look um, at the hierarchy. And I need a little more screen space here. There we go. I'm going to, uh, even more, sorry, with a resolution problem here. OK. Um, so I'm going to organize them by division. And I'll add division to my hierarchy. And now I can split them out. I can see central division, Midwest. Actually, I'm going to go back. And since it may be hard for you to see that, I'll pump up the size of the labels. So the, and I'll pump up the border padding to show the grouping. I hope you can see this now. You with me? All right, so we have Central, Pacific, Midwest, and Atlantic Division. And I don't know, do you see any particular division that has more uh, fouls in it? I don't quite see that yet. But we might look by teams now. We'll go back to our hierarchy. And we'll add the team as yet another second. We'll split out by division and split out by teams. 
And now, well, we're getting pretty busy here. And I've, I've put big borders, so it's a little bit less space. And again, this uh, screen has fairly low resolution, so I don't have too much room here. On your larger screens at home, you may be able to get more of the data here. But it's a good opportunity for me to switch from Squareify to Slice and Dice, because that gives a pretty nice layout here of, again, it does alphabetically, Atlantic Division, Central, Midwest, and Pacific. And then within Atlantic, Boston, Miami, New Jersey, New York, Orlando, alphabetically, and then alphabetically by the players. Okay, so now you can begin to see, and you can zoom in, zoom in on the, the, the division you want and zoom in on the team you want or zoom back out. And when we built this 15 years ago, smooth animated zooming was not such an option, but by now that would be the natural thing to do. Um, but we explored other things like the border padding. We could drop the border padding make the font size a lot smaller. In fact, we could get rid of the labels uh, and we could drop the borders. And now we're really into, we've lost some of the analytic capabilities, uh, although you can still you know, cursor around to see it, but we're now getting closer to the place where I have my paintbrushes and my control as an algorithmic you know, paintbrush to be able to shape these things. One of the recent articles about this exhibit, um, it, it said, um, making art with algorithms, which I liked very much. I'm making art with algorithms. It's not that the algorithms are making the art. I am making these as art, and the algorithms are my, my brushes, if you will. Okay, so I can play around with this. I can flip these. Okay, and I can begin to play more with palettes, or I can zoom in on sections or filter out other parts. And so the potentialities are there, and the one that you'll see hanging uh, in, the, in the corridor here has uh, all of these uh, 441 players and shows some really interesting patterns there. Let me pause again. I'll just ask if there's, I know you want, you want a question at the end, but any clarifications of this demo? This is something that people can visit online. That's right. Okay. You can go out there and you can get this for free. And you can take your data um, or you get some data sets with the download. And so you can work on this. And now, you know, other things will begin to pop out to your eyes once you begin to notice these things. If you're looking at the relative sizes, you will find that one of these divisions has eight teams and the other have seven teams. So that's kind of an interesting observation that you'll get if you pay attention to these uh, features here. All right, um, there's many more uh, features and manipulations you can carry out, uh, but I, I wanted to give you the basic idea of how we were free within constraints to explore the possibilities of color, aspect ratio, size of regions, thickness of borders, absence of borders, um, and, and then I was able to take the inspirations from leading art artists like Mondrian, Hans Hoffman, Jean Davis, Joseph Albers. We tried also Mark Rothko and Barnett Newman and others who had worked on rectangle strategies, Ellsworth Kelly, and so on. So that was where we came from. So I think, I'm, uh, I think I've think i got the story across. I wanted to convey first the academic research that led to commercial use and widespread use of tree maps. There are thousands of you know sites that use it. Uh, and then I wanted to take you along with how we did this, hopefully far enough so you can do this yourself. Okay. Thank you.